Your next, your second opinion set forth on page three is that the reimbursement claim lodged by Ozarks Coca-Cola Dr. Pepper Bottling Company Group Health Plan against Harold and Amanda Ritter will, if allowed, result in the utilization of plan assets in a manner which benefits persons and entities other than the participants and beneficiaries of the plan. Um, what documents specifically do you rely on to reach this opinion? Well, that opinion is based on far more than just documents in this file, although it's supported by the documents in this file. Well, let's start with the documents, because the file's got a lot of documents. Which of these and the ones you reviewed? Okay. Let me, let me ask this. Um, how do you, uh, when you say the plan assets will be utilized, how will they be utilized? The um, Amanda Ritter was insured in the pool of insureds, participants, and beneficiaries for the plan year 2006. If, uh, if reimbursement recovery is permitted, say to the tune of $40,000, uh, that money would not be realized by the uh, MedPay, by the plan administrator, or by any stop loss carrier until probably the year 2011, possibly the year 2012. And the receipt of that money will not benefit the pool of participants in the year 2006. It's physically impossible to do that, uh, to, to go back and to, to benefit those participants in the year 2006. Okay. Isn't why is it significant um, which pool of participate participants based on you know the year of their participation are are benefited? Well, it's it, it's it's not going to be the same pool. And and you know. E even under the operation of the plan, the way it's operated by Coca-Cola, actually none of the participants or beneficiaries in the year 2011 and 2012 are benefited either. None of them are. Well, how, how is it that the 2011 and 2012 participants wouldn't be benefit benefited? Because 100% of the proceeds that would filter down to the plan after paying any stop loss insurer and after paying attorney's fees and collection agencies will be simply used to offset the employer's contribution to the plan, not the employee's contributions. And how did you make that determination? What, what facts did you use or documents did you refer to to make that determination? Okay. Using the 2003 summary plan description, Page 71, under funding the plan and payments of benefits, it says for employee independent coverage, funding is derived solely from the funds of the employer. After that, it says the level of any employee contributions is set by the plan administrator. The plan administrator shall, from time to time, evaluate the cost of the plan and determine the amount to be contributed by the employer and the employees, if any, and reserves the right to change the level of employee contributions. All right, it's a, it's a fact of insurance that the rates for the plan year 2011 will be determined at the end of the year 2010. Reimbursement recoveries, subrogated recoveries, are not factored into the setting of the rates. And so the employee's contribution will be determined before the plan year begins. That's the whole nature of insurance. You take a risk, you spread it over a pool, and you account for it actuarially prior to the time period covered. So the employee contributions will be set prior to the plan year taking an effect in 2011. When the money comes in, if it comes in in 2011, the testimony, as I understand it, that Martin Myers gave in his deposition was that he just simply takes the money and deposits it into the fund. 
Well, 100% of that deposit offsets the employer's contribution. And then that frees up, he has $40,000 more as the employer than, than he would otherwise have. So it's a windfall for the employer of no benefit to the participants and benefits and certainly of no benefit to the participants and beneficiaries of the year, year 2006. And there's absolutely no effort made to go back and find out who those participants and beneficiaries are for the year 2006 and to benefit, with the, benefit them with that recovery. Which of the documents that you reviewed in this case led you to conclude that the employer's, off, or that the employer's funding obligations are going to be offset by any subrogation recovery? I just, I just read it to you. The employer okay, funds the plan. All right, all right. Is there any else? Yes. So, well, we have the same language in the 2008 SPD. We have the same language there. You want me to read okay. that or accept me from, accept that? Okay. No, I'll accept that. But my question is that plan, and then you went on. I'm to sorry. Make I'm sorry. You cut out. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You got to forward. Okay. <laughs> You, you read that plain, plan language, and then you made certain assumptions about how the plan determines the employee's funding contribution and, and the employer's funding contributions. Where in the evidence or the, the documents and the facts that you were provided, where it set out that that's how the different funding obligations are determined? It's not set out anywhere else. It comes from my general knowledge of how insurance takes place. You don't have any specific knowledge about how the plan itself makes these funding determinations. You're just basing it on what other insurance companies have, how they've um, uh, evaluated risk and set rates. What? Specific means specific to this plan. Specific to this plan. Sure. Well, <clears throat> other than what's in the uh, documents, which I've read, my knowledge comes from other ERISA plans, not just other insurance companies. But in terms of other insurance companies, the knowledge of subrogated rates, not uh, subrogated recoveries not affecting rates is universal. Every reported authority, primary and secondary, has recognized that. That subrogated relate rates are not reflected in, uh, subrogated recoveries are not reflected in rates. So I can stand here and tell you, or sit here and tell you, that every reported authority, primary and secondary, it's been my job as an academic to research these authorities and keep track of them, have all, have all concluded that subrogated recoveries do not have an impact on rates. Now, in this case, in an ERISA plan, the subrogated recoveries, if, if any filters down to the employer sponsor administrator, which is Coca-Cola in this case, 100% of that offsets his contribution to the plan, and that's specifically prohibited under ERISA's anti annulment statute. Now, you're making that statement based on these primary authorities that you reference generally. What are those authorities? Well, many of them are cited in that article, where does the money go? I don't have all those authorities. I'll put it this way. I've never seen any authority that says anything different. And there's nothing in any of the documents I've reviewed uh, for this case that suggests anything different. So that I'm clear on on what benefit we're talking about here, the pri the private benefit that you're talking about is a reimbursement or or a benefit to the employer itself, correct? Correct. Is there a, a, and because of that, you claim that that, that creates a, a private inner or a, yes, a, a private inurement that's prohibited under ERISA. Well, if you if you look at my exhibit one. The, the statute says the assets of the plan no, shall never inure to the benefit of any employer. It's not a private benefit, it's the benefit of the employer here. The statute itself specifically prohibits this benefit to the employer. Okay, Exhibit 1, you have a quote from Arissa. Is that is that basically what Exhibit One is? It's it's your quotes of excerpts from Section 
from 29 U.S.C. Section 1103 and 29 U.S.C. Selection, section 1104, correct? Yes. So Exhibit 1 just sets out what's in those statutes, or at least part of it? Yes. You didn't, you didn't draft it? Oh, right. I mean, you're, you're right. Right on point. I agree with you. Is there any authority that tells you that the um, that it, the employer's recovery of, or reimbursement violates the anti annulment provision? What do you mean by any authority? Other than the, other than the statute? Other is that is that the only authority you rely on? That's all I'm relying on at this point in time. Correct. Is there any case law? Is there any is there any uh, What about case law or regulations? I don't think that's been addressed. Okay. And when you say when you say that that's all you rely on at this time, are you anticipating some other authority that you'll be relying on in the future? We might get a good case from another court any day now. Who knows? And in case if that happens, I would rely on that. I'm not aware of any case law. You know. I'm not aware of any case law that is held otherwise. I'm not aware of any case law that is held otherwise. Okay. So this is a novel question of law, correct? You, you can call it novel if you want. I think it's a fundamental protection for Harold and Amanda Ritter, and in that regard, I wouldn't denigrate it to the, to the concept that it's novel. Courts never addressed it? To my knowledge, no. Correct. Is that everything um, that we've talked? We've talked about the facts that led you to reach this opinion. We've talked about the documents that you relied on to reach this opinion. Are there any other facts or documents that you rely on to determine that there's a um, that uh, the reimbursement claim will result in the utilization of plan assets um, in a way that benefits other persons? Yeah, yes, there's a couple other things that I should mention. Uh, first off. I, I should bear in mind that when rates are determined for health insurance coverage, they are determined in anticipation on an actuarial basis. And a, there is no subrogation possibility if the participant or beneficiary has medical bills because of illness or disease. There is no possibility of reimbursement or subrogation if this is an illness or disease or ailment caused by an act of God, like being struck by lightning, if this is a negligent accident caused by the beneficiary, there is no possibility of recovery if there's no funds available. If this is an accident that generates injuries where both parties are at fault, there's no possibility of recovery. Uh, if this is an accident entire, caused entirely by somebody who has no insurance or, or, or assets, so in other words, on an actuarial basis, the fact that there might be a subrogated recovery is far too remote, speculative, and will recur far too down the road uh, to, in order to impact on rates. And so that's why I say when rates are determined immediately preceding the plan year, you one cannot, I sit on the board of directors for an insurance company, I know how this works. You cannot take subrogated recoveries into consideration when you set the rates. And then if you do have a subrogated recovery or reimbursement that's paid out, that, that's just pure windfall. It always has been pure windfall to the insurer or whoever benefits from it. In this case, it's the employer. The other observation I would make is this, this particular employer, Coca-Cola, is on record as stating that it is under no obligation to continue to provide health insurance. It can modify coverage or it can terminate coverage anytime it wants. So if this employer decides to not offer health insurance for the year 2011, it can do so. And if it does so, we still have a subrogated recovery of $40,000 or whatever part he is ultimately going to be provided flowing to that employer who, who, who now is, not, is no, under no obligation to continue to provide health insurance to, to anyone. So and these are other factors I'm taking a look at and telling you that it's a violation of the anti annulment provision. Okay. How does the fact that... Um Okay, first of all, you stated that rate, um, rate determinations don't take into consideration the possibility of subrogation. 
And, and you testified about that in the context of an insurance company. Do you have specific knowledge about how Coke, uh, Coke's benefit plan considers or factors in subrogation when it's setting, the, the possibility of subrogation when it's setting its rates? I, I do not. And, and, and rates being contribution rates. I, I do not. I'm not. Did you want him to answer that previous question, or do you want to strike that? I mean, because he started to answer before you guys discussed. So I just well, want to let, me, let me strike that and ask okay. this: When you talk about rates, um, are you talking about employee contribution rates or insurance rates? Well, in that context, I was talking about employee contribution rates, but it applies to everything and applies to, to to rates in general, but also in particular with respect to employee contribution rates. And I will acknowledge that I have no involvement. I have no access to what happens actually with Coca-Cola because I'm on the outside. I, I don't know what goes on there. But I'm telling you, based on my knowledge and information gained from being involved in this business for as long as I have been, that this, these are how employee contribution rates are determined. You're making assumptions to reach this opinion that, um, that the, subrogation, the right of subrogation isn't going to affect employee contribution rates. You're making that assumption, is that, isn't that correct? Well, it's not an assumption because I do rely on CJ telling me that Marty Myers testified in his deposition that if he gets any money, he just puts it into the fund. Now, when he just puts it into the fund, he's offsetting the employer's contribution. He's not offsetting the employee's contributions because that was predetermined uh, in the process of setting the rates. Did you have Marty Myers' deposition testimony available when you rendered your opinion, when you, when you, uh, sent this uh, report off to Mr. Bradshaw? Certainly not, no. Okay. But it's not a surprise. It was to so be expected. When you, so when you wrote the opinion, you were making assumptions on facts that, that you didn't necessarily know, you just assumed would be true. Assumption on facts that are consistent in every single case I've been involved in, yes. Okay. Now, I still don't understand how... The fact that there may be sub or the, the, I'm sorry, the fact that subrogation may not be considered in determining employee contribution rates. How does that subsequently equate to a private benefit to the employer? It's simply where does the money go? Historically, once again, all reported authorities, primary and secondary, say it's a windfall to the insurer. In the ERISA context, it's a windfall to the employer. In this in this type of plan. Okay. It's it's treated, if you will, as if you set up a reserve and you don't use it. If you set up a reserve as an insurance company, you have a big claim, so you set, a, set aside $100,000 for this claim. You defeat the claim, then all of a sudden you have $100,000 that you've set aside, and now you get to bring it back as discretionary funds into the operation of, the, of, the, of your insurance company. As an ERISA plan, when you receive reimbursement claims, they come back and it's, uh, it's money that you can't count on uh, actuarially, uh, but you but you have this money, and so you use that to to offset what the empl the employer uses it to offset his contribution. Okay. Um, you already mentioned that there was. You know, no you know, I have another a comment on that too. One of the one of the primary reasons I know that this goes to the employer, in, in addition to everything else, is because the employer is fighting us so much. This employer is not fighting us on behalf of the employees. I guarantee you, he's fighting this because he wants the money. He wants whatever money he's going to get, or he's obligated to provide that to his stop loss insurers. He is not. If 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 this employer were truly concerned about the employees, uh, then you wouldn't see this fight. Period. Okay. Again, you're you're making assumptions, though. Isn't that correct? So, some of that's on assumptions. You, you don't have you don't have any facts that tell you what the plan's motivation is or what the employer's motivation is. I, you're just making an assumption. I, I know that if 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 expenses come along and you and you read the language that I read from both SPDs, if expenses come along and it's going to cost more, it's just passed right on to the employee. There's no hesitation in taking uh, anticipated expenses are going to be higher for whatever cost, and you pass that on to the employee. 
And that's a general mode of operation in business today with insurance companies and anybody doing business. You just pass increased costs along. This is just an increased cost. I'm going to move to strike that. Um, is there any other private benefit that you see causes a problem with the anti-inurement anti provision? I think we've covered it. <laughs>